Sorry, guys. I'm just hanging out. Uh, I am Katie Friddle, and I'm in the planning department, and I'm going to talk to you guys today about what we in the planning department does, uh, do, what we do. Um, so I am the principal planner for current planning and urban design, which is one of the divisions in the planning department. And um, so I'll go through what each of our kind of divisions does and um, how we all work together. Um, if you are in the planning department, will you raise your hand? Okay, we are like disproportionately represented in mentor circle. So if I say something about what you do and I'm wrong, feel free to like flag me down and, uh, and add to it. But um, hopefully just kind of zip through what all of our different divisions work on and then have plenty of time to answer any questions you all may have. Um, I think to start, I would say, you know, everybody that works for the city, um, our overall goal is to make the city a better place for people to live and to work and to want to come and visit. And planning's role in accomplishing that is taking kind of the 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 foot view of what's happening in our city on the ground, what we anticipate happening in the future, and how we can best set ourselves up for success with all of those um, changes and challenges that might come our way. So with that, um, we'll go through each of our programs. So we have, um, one, two, three, we have five divisions in the planning department, and they do a huge range of things. I think most people think of planners and think that you are in an office at a table writing a plan, writing a document that will sit on a shelf um, as some sort of reference guide for the next 20 years, and then after that you write it again. Um, but in reality, when you look at what the planning department does and all the different parts of the city that we touch, there's a lot more than that to planning. Um, this is kind of our divisions broken down by sub areas, um, programs within each of those divisions. So we have um, plan development and implementation, PDI, current planning and urban design, housing and community development, subdivision and zoning, and then administration. Um, subdivision and zoning until fairly recently was in development services. Before that it was in planning, so it just kind of hops back and forth every couple of decades, but right now we have subdivision and zoning in, in the planning department. And we love them and we're happy to have them. Um, so plan development and implementation is maybe the most traditional um, planning uh, activities. They have um, programs for comprehensive planning, neighborhood and commercial district revitalization, transportation planning, and area plans and strategic plans. So why do we need all of these plans? Um, like I said, these are ways that we as a city can look at the issues that are facing the city, whether that's population growth, whether that's economic challenges, housing, which is, we all know is a huge issue right now, health and wellness, transportation, air quality, and figure out ways that we as a city can proactively address each of those issues. Um, there are many different types and categories of plans that start from the smallest a uh, little neighborhood area plan all the way to a comprehensive plan looking at the entire metropolitan area of Oklahoma City. So basic ingredients of a plan are a vision for where that community wants to be, whether that's, again, a tiny little neighborhood um, or a small commercial district or the entire city as a whole, looking at the issues and trends that are affecting that community, figuring out the goals and objectives that we as a community want to um, set so that we can address uh, those issues, developing specific policies and strategies um, and um, initiatives to address those issues and to meet those goals, and then creating an implementation component to a plan so that we know what we're doing to meet those goals, we can measure those steps, we can um, demonstrate progress toward implementation of a plan. So one example of a master plan is the Quarter Shore Plan that was done in 2008. This was envisioning what we wanted development to look like as we planned for a new park at the time um, between downtown and the river, wanting to see growth of the city as we moved I-40 out of the core um, and wanted new infill development to come in into that area. So that was an early kind of vision of what we wanted that development in that Quarter Shore area to look like. A functional plan is something like Bike Walk OKC. This is a more specific kind of on the ground, how do we facilitate um, bicycle transportation, pedestrian amenities in our city, on our streets as we are 
um, developing, modifying, um, redoing our transportation network. And then the comprehensive plan. Plan OKC was adopted in 2015 and really guides the majority of all of the other efforts in the planning department. Everything that we're doing is tying back to the goals and initiatives and issues in Plan OKC um, so that we can accomplish that larger vision. And this really does envision how we want Oklahoma City at large to grow and develop and be revitalized and reinvested in for the next 20 plus years. Plan OKC touches on all these different topics that um, impact the way we live and work and interact with our city and our community from transportation to housing choice to the environment to making sure that our neighborhoods are healthy and that our community is an attractive, desirable place where people want to come and visit and locate their business and uh, live and work. So uh, Plan OKC establishes land use typology areas. We call them LUDAs. And you may hear that term more and more because we are also doing a code update currently that is going to tie back in to the LUDAs, the land use typology areas, so that your zoning is consistent with the type of development in your part of the city. And basically the LUDAs are acknowledging the fact that development in the downtown core is different from development that we see in the the neighborhoods closest in to downtown that are kind of within the loop of the interstates. And it's different from the suburban development that we see farther out as you get closer to Yukon and Mustang and Midwest City and more in those areas. And it's different from the areas of our city that are still rural today. And we want to ensure that we um, guide development in each of those areas in a way that's appropriate with the character that we want to see in those different parts of the city. So the LUDAs are intended to help us to do that, both as we review individual zoning applications and development proposals, and as we look at updating the municipal code, uh, the planning and zoning code. In addition to the land use typology areas, one of the things Plan OKC does is establish street typologies. This is recognizing that even within a certain land use typology area, you have a very different character of um, development and what gets built and what people want to see on different street types. May Avenue is very different from Northwest 10th Street, is different from 16th, is different from a little neighborhood street, you know, winding through an area that doesn't even connect through to another major arterial. So Plan OKC uses the street typologies to further refine the types of development we want to see from one street to another, one block to another. Uh, most recently, we adopted a new sign code, and the sign code is kind of the first um, zoning tool to use the street typology as part of the um, metrics for what kinds of signs you can have and where you can have them based on what kind of a street you're on. Um, transportation planning is another part of the um, Plan Development and Implementation Division. So they work very closely with Public Works and with MAPS and other departments and partners on how our transportation system works for us and where we need to improve things, change things, uh, make it work better citywide. Um, one of the exciting things that they are working on is a Vision Zero um, program. They got their, the city got an $800,000 grant um, to work toward a Vision Zero plan that eliminates traffic fatalities through better um, transportation design. So that's the kind of thing that transportation planners are looking at, is big picture, how do we make our transportation network work better for our city. PDI also houses our commercial district revitalization program. If anyone's ever, <laughs> um, people are cheering for PDI. PDI uh, CDRP is very enthusiastic. Um, if you've ever had any interaction with a Main Street program in other cities, uh, Department of State Department of Commerce has a Main Street program, and they work with small towns all over the state to revitalize their Main Streets. I see CDRP as kind of Oklahoma City's own little Main Street program. We work with smaller commercial districts that kind of function like a Main Street within their part of the city to help them to build capacity, to develop, to um, have staff there as kind of district leadership um, so that they can improve the quality and um, strength of their commercial districts within each area of their city. They can brand themselves, create strategic plans, um, so that instead of it just being 
disassociated little individual businesses, you get commercial districts that have a real identity to them, like the Plaza District, like Paseo, like Britain District, like Capitol Hill. Um, each of those areas is part of the commercial district program and has um, worked with the city to use those resources and make their commercial district stronger. So what planning department does is um, provide funding for staff so that those districts can have an executive director, provide technical um, guidance, uh, organizational assistance, advocate um, and help those um, districts to navigate through different processes with the city. Uh, we help them to establish business improvement districts if they want to do that and support that process. Um, and we have statistics to show that being in one of these commercial district revitalization programs is a really good thing, not only for those business owners, but for the surrounding community. Um, we can see, like it says here, that um, there's 50% increase in home value over citywide markets for those properties that are within a residential neighborhood served by an independent business district. So these are our um, districts. Have we added any? Does this look complete? Okay, so Farmer's Market is yet another commercial district revitalization program participant. Um, so poll number one, just show of hands, when you look at all these districts, are these places that you like to shop, like to visit, like to go get something to eat and drink after work? Yeah, okay, nice, see, so it's working. Yeah, I, th I think just about any place in the city that people can name um, as a district is part of this program. So kind of the residential counterpart to the commercial district revitalization program is the Strong Neighborhoods Initiative. This is another program of the uh, PDI division that works with individual neighborhoods to grow their capacity to strengthen their neighborhood, advocate for themselves, connect to resources, whether that's grant funds or other programs through the city or through the state um, that can help build stronger neighborhoods. Um, this is a program that neighborhoods have to um, apply and be selected to participate in. It's not something that the city just comes in and imposes upon a neighborhood. They have to really demonstrate that they are interested in and that they have the capacity to be a partner in the Strong Neighborhoods, um, the SNI program. So goals are you know, improving the quality of life in a neighborhood, improving property values, um, increasing home ownership, um, helping owners to stay in their neighborhood and age in place, uh, making improvements to streetscape, to infrastructure where that's needed, um, reducing the number of vacant properties, um, and just generally engaging the neighborhood so that they can form a stronger community amongst all of their neighborhoods. This map shows the, um, so the blue are previous SNI neighborhood participants and then the current ones are in the red. So they go through a cycle of um, a couple of years where they work with the city as SNI and then they kind of graduate and they are hopefully off and running with their own strengthened, empowered neighborhood association abilities. So just some numbers um, from Capital View, which was a recent um, SNI participant uh, showing city dollars that were invested that were vastly outweighed by private dollars that were brought into the neighborhood through the program. Uh, sale prices for square foot for homes going up, average home sale prices going up, crime for the most part going down. Um, those are all the kinds of things that we want to see and that we hope to facilitate in these neighborhoods through these programs. Um, there's uh, construction projects that get done, rehabilitating existing homes, building new homes um, with various partners, um, planting trees, putting in sidewalks where they don't have sidewalks. So all those different pieces and parts come together uh, for each of these neighborhoods that participates. So current planning and urban design, uh, this is my division. Um, so ask all the questions about this one. Um, <laughs> um, basically our goal is to ensure quality development throughout the city. Um, the, the UD, the urban design in CPUD, uh, oversees six um, design review districts. We have five design districts and then we have uh, historic preservation and historic landmark districts. There's a total of nine of those individual districts and then we also have nine individual landmarks. We review each of those uh, staff and then appointed volunteer committees 
review all types of development, renovation, new construction in each of those designated areas according to specific guidelines and regulations adopted by the city to guide development in these specific locations where we want to see a particular type of um, growth and investment. So the, the five um, design districts are primarily commercial, although they do all have some residential property in them. Um, and each of them are very different. Urban design is scattered about the city, kind of throughout the core, and many of the urban design districts also happen to be in our commercial district revitalization program. So those are areas like Uptown 23rd, like the Plaza District, Paseo, Capitol Hill, um, those kinds of areas where we want to protect that kind of unique distinctive character that makes those commercial districts um, a, a place that people want to be and that people want to open businesses and come and um, visit when they come to Oklahoma City. Bricktown is Bricktown, everybody knows that, um, and it has its own very distinctive character and it has many historic buildings within the Bricktown core. So they have their own committee and their own set of guidelines and regulations to kind of protect the development that happens there and guide new construction. Um, Stockyards is our smallest district. It's our quietest district, as you can see by the number of cases that they've reviewed. That's what that list is, by the way. Um, 22, 23, they only had three applications because uh, it's just a smaller area. But Stockyards, once again, it's a very distinctive district. It's uh, almost all of the core of Stockyards is a National Register historic district. So we want to make sure that rehabilitation of buildings there and construction of new buildings is in keeping with that special character that makes Stockyard such an important place in our city. Um, downtown covers the entire downtown core. Um, you know, in downtown, as opposed to a Stockyards, we want to see really dense, really tall urban development um, infill new construction. So there's guidelines for downtown that shoot for that and direct people to do that compared to some of the other districts that have a a lower scale of development. And then Scenic River runs all along the riverfront. Um, sorry, I should have showed you guys my map. So the green hatch all across the river from Meridian all the way over to First Americans Museum is um, the Scenic River Overlay Design District. And that has everything from industrial sites to single family homes. So all of those different areas go through a design review process. And then in the dark, in the solid green and the yellow, are our, our, our historic districts. Um, and those are predominantly residential. There are some commercial areas there, um, but those have all been identified as historically significant. All of them are also on the National Register and um, go through their own design review process with the HP Commission. And this is just quickly kind of each of our, some examples of the types of projects each of the different design districts has seen over the last couple of years. Cutest library in Oklahoma City. I'm just gonna say. Um, Urban Design Commission oversees Cottage District, so when you drive through that area south of St. Anthony's and see all those crazy houses going up, that's, that's their area. Um, and then HP uh, reviews new construction, we review rehabilitation of existing buildings, we review uh, any National Register nomination that gets submitted in Oklahoma City. People might have noticed Browns is getting a bit of a facelift and that is through a historic tax credit project um, to rehab that building. So does anyone live, work, shop, hang out in any of those design review districts? I'll go back to my map. Yes, yes, awesome. So in addition to the design review component of historic preservation, we also have a preservation program that does other things. We work with the State Historic Preservation Office to um, do a lot of survey and inventory work. That's to identify and document and kind of catalog historic properties and districts across Oklahoma City. This is a um, map showing some of our survey data. We have tens of thousands of properties in GIS that have been recorded in one form or another through survey and inventory work. We work with the state to do National Register nominations for individual properties and districts that want to be recognized in that way, that perhaps want to pursue historic tax credits to fund their rehabilitation. Um, we have one whopping uh, preservation easement on the Skirvin Hotel that we ma maintain with them and that protects the exterior of the building from any inappropriate changes. Um, we would love to have more of those types of things. It's a great kind of alternative tool to historic preservation zoning. 
Um, and we recently adopted the city's first um, citywide historic preservation plan, Preserve OKC, to look at how we can better facilitate preserving, recognizing, uh, rehabilitating historic buildings citywide. Uh, current planning is the CP in CPUD, and they do conformance review for um, basically zoning applications, anything that's going to planning commission against the comprehensive plan. So those cases get reviewed by all sorts of different departments. They get reviewed by subdivision and zoning, but current planning is specifically looking at the comprehensive plan and whether or not it supports applications to rezone a property, to close an easement, to plat a property. Um, they look at street name changes, um, all different types of applications that are going before planning commission. Uh, also housed within current planning and urban design is the development codes update, although just about every division in the department and many departments throughout the city are also touching this effort. This is a multi-year, multi-phased effort to completely rewrite the planning and zoning code um, to better align it with Plan OKC that was adopted previously and look at how we can um, meet all of those metrics that Plan OKC lays out with a new code. So housing and community development. Um, this division does amazing things. Um, they are really out in the field working with our neighbors, working with people who need the most help across our city, getting stuff done, making projects happen. And it's always amazing to me when we get to hear about the kinds of things that they work on. And I think it really changes your mindset about what planners do. Like I said, they're not sitting at a desk writing a document putting pretty pictures in it that somebody might look at, you know, 20 years later. They are really um, improving the lives of the residents of Oklahoma City. So housing rehab, homelessness programs, economic development, brownfields programs are all within housing and community development. They administer a wide range and a huge dollar amount of um, grant programs, many different federal funding mechanisms to facilitate housing rehab, um, construction of affordable housing, helping people purchase homes um, that are income qualified, uh, neighborhood revitalization, they work closely hand in hand with our neighborhood, uh, our Strong Neighborhoods Initiative program, um, other public services, uh, environmental assessments and cleanup, um, small business loans, small business lending, and then other economic development initiatives and of course our homelessness programs. So economic development, um, just about every really big project that you see get done in Oklahoma City has probably been touched by this program. This is just one example. 21C Hotel, um, down just down the street from here, um, worked, with our, um, worked with this division to tap into a variety of federal funds, grant and loan programs um, to be able to get that project done. Created 220 new full-time jobs, and put a building um, into a new use that was a really great um, contributor to our downtown. They also work with small businesses on training programs and small business loans to get those up and running off the ground. Another recent example of a project that this di um, division worked closely with is the First National Center. They tapped into all sorts of different funding sources, but some of those were through our um, community and housing development division. Our homelessness program works with many different partners within the city and other agencies and organizations that also work um, to address homelessness. One of their um, big projects that they do each year is the point in time count. Uh, volunteers go out on one designated night and identify all the people that are on that night unhoused in Oklahoma City. They partner with shelters to identify the, to calculate the head count in all of those different facilities and then also go to places where they know people are sleeping outside overnight and are unhoused. So these are the numbers from I think the 2023 point in time count and these are used for us to measure over time what's happening with that homeless population, what are the demographics of it, are numbers going up, are numbers going down, where can we do better and provide more assistance. Um, so, as I said, they work with all different partners across the city to get people housed, to um, meet those different needs, um, to try to help our homeless population. Our Brownfields program uh, also works closely with um, the federal government 
and provides technical and financial assistance for clearing and getting brownfields revitalized. Brownfields come in all different shapes and sizes and are basically sites that either are actually contaminated or may be perceived to be contaminated and unfit for development. So they work with property owners to go out and assess those sites and determine what kind of abatement or mitigation of those hazards is needed. And they also provide assistance to actually get that work done and clear up those sites. So these are just some of the examples of um, places that have tapped into those brownfield funds. Um, some other examples are First National Center, Scissor Tail Park, the Wheeler District, the Skirvin, um, Paige Woodson, the Sunshine Cleaners Building. Um, so it can be, you know, the kind of stereotypical thing you think of is um, some sort of industrial facility or a gas station where there's tanks underground that might be leaking into the soil. But it can also be a perfectly normal looking building that has hazardous building materials in it, like asbestos, that kind of thing, that need to be abated before it can be redeveloped to be safe. Our housing rehab team works to um, provide and maintain and repair and improve housing for low income and senior um, qualified residents in Oklahoma City. They did 50 or so home repairs in the past year um, and spent roughly $2 million a year on housing rehab programs for income qualified homeowners throughout the city. So, um, and I think they also do, they work with folks doing infill housing construction as well. Um, oh, was that what I did? So subdivision and zoning, um, our recent steal from um, development services. Subdivision and zoning staffs the planning commission as well as the board of adjustment. So all things zoning of your property, what you can do with it, what you can build there, how do you change what you can do with it so that you can do what you want to do with it, um, what can your neighbor do with their property over there and should they be allowed to do that. Um, all of those things are in subdivision and zoning's wheelhouse. And then board of adjustment plays a role in that when someone needs um, a variance or special exception related to what their zoning does or does not allow them to do. So everything from assigning an address to a property because it's been split or is being redeveloped in some way, reviewing rezoning applications, staffing and administering the planning commission hearings, forwarding all those materials on to the city council for their review and approval, um, working closely with developers, with property owners, with interested residents that are perhaps concerned about a rezoning product, project. Um, these are all the types of things that our subdivision and zoning division is responsible for. And this is just the kind of insane volume of cases they, they handle in a typical year, um, from Board of Adjustment applications to all the different types of rezoning applications. Um, and these are really where we are putting kind of that 10,000 foot view of Plan OKC um, into action on the ground on a case by case basis. Um, it's one thing to say, we want to see um, density and mixed use development in this general region of the city. It's another thing when an individual property owner comes in and has this specific lot on this corner with these conditions and they wanna build exactly this project. Can we make that meet the current code? Do they need to rezone to another zoning district? Do they need to craft their own um, unique individual zoning district, which is called a SPUD? Um, what are the neighbors going to think um, what are the other departments that have to review these things going to think? These, we work closely on these with development services, with um, utilities, with public works to uh, ensure that all the way along the process, what they're going to do is consistent with what everybody else wants to see on the ground and is going to have the ability to ultimately approve and get built. Uh, within our administration division, we have the Office of Arts and Cultural Affairs and the Office of Sustainability. So arts is a mighty team of two and a half people and they administer the 1% for arts ordinance. This is an ordinance that requires 1% of the budget on city projects. Um, there's more finesse to that, but that's how I'll describe it for now. 1% uh, of those budgets to be spent on public art. So anytime you see a new city project going in, a new library, um, 
convention center, a park, any of those kinds of things, 1% of that budget has to go towards some sort of public art installation. So obviously that budget's gonna dictate the scope and scale of that art. Arts uh, and cultural affairs staff works closely with other city departments and with artists and with their arts commission to um, take those projects through an entire process of identifying what the appropriate artwork is for that piece and getting that selected and approved. Um, they staff the city's Arts Commission, which is an advisory body to city council. Um, Arts and Cultural Affairs also manages the city's extensive collection of public art, um, doing maintenance where maintenance is need to be done, um, kind of cataloging and maintaining records on all the different art pieces that are all over Oklahoma City, uh, and just taking um, responsibility for the care and preservation of all of those works. And then they provide technical assistance to the public. When an artist or a property owner is trying to get some sort of artwork done, a mural, um, some other type of installation, the Arts and Cultural Affairs Office is there to help them get all the way through that process and get the work done and permits issued as needed, that sort of thing. Last but not least, our Office of Sustainability. Um, they manage a wide range of programs, uh, educational outreach um, efforts to make our city um, more sustainable and better for the environment. They administer a number of different grant programs to help individuals and property owners to improve the environmental efficient energy efficiency of their properties. Um, they've worked on a solarized campaign and various guides for being solar ready and EV ready. They work with other departments on how we can better equip um, property owners, the public, to make their um, properties more environmentally friendly. Uh, ADAPT OKC is our sustainability plan that was adopted right around the same time as the preservation plan and out outlines um, programs and policies and initiatives for better environmental sustainability in Oklahoma City. Um, they, are, they also work with other departments and other um, agencies throughout the region on things like bike lanes, um, which is a big part of us being more environmentally friendly and getting cars off the road and more bikes and more feet on the street. Um, and they do a lot of other educational outreach about various environmental issues that are important to our city. So that is the last of my divisions and programs, and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you all might have. Yes. So like a commercial district? It could be a commercial district, it could be anything from like a standard type of place to things that you want to do for residents Sure. So I think, I mean, the starting point would be sitting down with planning staff to talk about what, what is the identity of that district and what is it that you want to get out of making it a district. Our design districts have regulations in place that um, have teeth to them and that require property owners to do certain things and prohibit them from doing other things. So that's a, a more, um, you know, yeah, a more regulatory tool. Um, same with historic preservation. If it has the historic preservation zoning, then there are strict rules in place about what you can and can't do. There's a review process to go through for all of that. Um, if you're really looking for the commercial district program where there's not so many rules um, and checks and boxes in place, but more assistance, incentives, um, you know, technical assistance, um, coordination with staff to do that branding, do that kind of creating an identity, then we would route you that way. So I think the, um, yeah, the starting point is figuring out what exactly it is that that district feels like they need at that point and then going down any or all of those paths. So. Yes? How will this impact policy in Texas and where they live at the time? Are you guys surveying the residents of what they actually want and need? Or is it just the business owners who are making these decisions in that community or area? For like the land use typology for stuff in the plan? So it depends on which 
which effort um, is underway. For Plan OKC, there was a huge amount of public outreach over numerous years talking to people about what they wanted to see happen in Oklahoma City. It was also a lot of evaluation of what was actually on the ground. Um, where does our, where's kind of the natural, you know, boundary for areas that are more urban in character already, where we would want to continue to see a more urban development pattern, where are the areas that are more suburban, where do we have stuff that is still rural, um, still maybe in an undeveloped state, and we want to keep it that way and keep it green and limit sprawl out into those areas. So that's a combination of public input from residents, property owners, development community, city leaders, as well as just documenting the conditions that already exist. Um, that also looked a lot at w existing infrastructure. Where do we have the capacity to serve more people and more businesses, and where would we have to continue to build more and more streets, sewers, fire stations, all those kinds of things if we continue to grow in that way. Um, so that's kind of for Plan OKC. When we look at these other smaller type plans, whether that's transportation or um, sustainability or preservation, um, there is public outreach to those. A lot of times it might be more targeted to interested groups or geographic areas that are impacted by those efforts. So if we're saying, do we need a bike lane from this neighborhood to that neighborhood? Well, we're not going to ask people over there if they want a bike lane. We're going to ask the people, you know, along that route, what do you want to see happen to your street? That kind of thing. So it just depends on what the what the goal is and who we're oop, who we're impacting, and that kind of guides the the type of outreach that we do. But we do always want to get not just the developer, not just the business owner, but the residents that are living and working in that area and are going to be impacted by development. Other questions? Yes. So that, again, kind of varies widely from one program to another, and I might see if any of my other planning colleagues want to talk about um, how they do that for their particular programs. Sometimes it's something where we just have a couple of staff working on something, but we're able to access federal funds and then pass those through to another organization so that they can kind of do the work on the ground. Um, sometimes there are organizations that ha just have more kind of agility than we do as a government entity to um, spend money, get things done um, that we partner with to facilitate those kinds of things. Obviously with the neighborhood programs, we're working with things like the Neighborhood Alliance um, to help build neighborhood capacity. We're working with individual neighborhood associations. Um, yeah, any, Kayla, do you have any thoughts? I'm gonna, yeah, call on you. Cause your program does a lot of that. I think a lot of times we are we are filling gaps and we are connecting dots between 
um, private nonprofit sector resources out there. So I think about like with homelessness, you have all these different entities that are, you know, they're getting unhoused people into their first home. They're, you know, getting resources to various shelters. They're targeting specific demographics like youth or families or children. Um, and they all have their little areas of, of focus. And we as the city can kind of be an umbrella over that to some extent and see, okay, where are we not meeting a need? How can we help the, facilitate all of them working together? Um, we're not taking over, we're not running the programs, but we're just being a, a partner in that to make all of that work work together as best it can. So. Others? If there's no other questions, I think we're done 10 minutes early. Um, that's all I have. Yeah, thank you everyone.